Welcome to the third day of the Platform Summit. Um, our first guest, our first speaker is uh, Mitch Kapoor. And uh, I'm almost not sure where to start here. Mitch is uh, someone that I've gotten to know very well in the last several years, um, but He's an industry legend. He is the, uh, uh, the founder and creator of Lotus123. He was the founding uh, chair of the Mozilla Foundation uh, and uh, uh, one of the founders of the Electronic uh, EFF, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation that really fights for our digital human rights. And uh, he is currently the uh, co-chair of the Kapoor Center with uh, his wife, uh, Frida Kapoor Klein, who we heard from yesterday. I am incredibly proud and pleased and excited to have this discussion with my dear friend, Mitch Kapoor. So, I, uh, I was not expecting this conversation to start off uh, in such a, a, a heavy way, but uh, last night, um, while I was having dinner, and I guess we were all having dinner and partying and socializing, uh, the, the Trayvon, Mer uh, 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 Trayvon Martin uh, 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 verdict was handed down, and he was... Uh, uh, deemed not guilty uh, by six jurors in Florida, and it somehow seems relevant to this gathering. And, uh, well, let me just start there. Uh, Mitch, do you have any, what are your thoughts? You know, it, first I want to give some, a lot of credit to my wife, Frida, who is, uh, my life partner and professional partner in these matters and when you hear me speaking please understand at least 51 percent of the content comes from from her uh, <laughs> but w w what i want to say is that when you have racial profiling in the large which is to say when the mainstream of society sees people of color as thugs, not as players in the innovation economy. You wind up with a whole spectrum of things. And if you connect the dots, there is a line between what happened to Trayvon Martin and Ted Schlein's remarks yesterday. I don't want to equate them as being the same, but they're on the same continuum. And that is something that just can't be ignored. And, and I have one other thought. It occurred to me, the other famous person that I know for wearing a hoodie is Mark Zuckerberg. Nobody is profiling Mark Zuckerberg and nobody is taking him down. And we're only gonna have the kind of country that we ought to have when Trayvon can wear a hoodie and Mark Zuckerberg can wear a hoodie and they're not treated any differently. And we are so far from that, sadly. So one of the uh, sort of underlying dialogues uh, at Platform and in uh, underrepresented communities uh, in the innovation economy certainly is that it's a meritocracy. Um, obviously, if there's rampant racial prejudice, there can't be a meritocracy. We've obviously come a long way from Dr. Martin Luther King, but perhaps not far enough. Where are we right now? Uh, uh, on the uh, meritocracy spectrum? 
I think, as we heard yesterday, I mean, it is still very much a core belief among the powerful and the gatekeepers in Silicon Valley uh, and elsewhere that this innovation economy operates as a meritocracy. The best ideas are the ones that win and the best teams are the ones that get funded. And if you don't get funded, there's something wrong with you. And um, as I pointed out, tried to point out yesterday, um, that's just, it's, it's, it's totally bogus. And we have to find a way to engage with that. And I think actually one of my big takeaways from platform is to talk very directly about the ways in which being colorblind or agnostic actually perpetuates uh, the problems rather than solves them and, and, and approach that very directly. That's a good entry point, and I'm certainly planning on, on following up with that. The meritocracy is largely, mm, I would say, aspirational um, and not actual. And there are all sorts of things. I think about how can we get things unfrozen a little bit. And I'm aware that there are all sorts of conversations that happen privately that don't happen publicly. And I'm going to give two examples, one on each side. And we need to find a way to begin to have those conversations more publicly. So I had two separate conversations here in which uh, highly professional African-American men here have told me the extent to which they consistently, automatically alter their behavior in public places so as not to be threatening to white women, like in elevators. I guarantee that Ted Schlein and his colleagues and everybody else at all the venture firms have zero clue this is happening or why it might happen or the kind of the, the, the price that's paid. They just have no idea of the felt and lived experience. On the other side of it, while, yes, we've come a great distance from the very overt prejudice and the discrimination which follows from it, it still exists in the private conversations that you hear, that I'm part of, that I know about, that happen all the time, really reveal it. And let me see if I want to. Well, so one example I would give is in a venture firm, they get a plan from an African-American entrepreneur. And this particular plan is not a good one. It's not something that's fundable based on what's on the paper. But then one of the partners say, said, I don't want to see more plans from these people because this is what they're like. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you don't make that conclusion if you get a bad plan from a white guy. You don't go, oh, those white guys, they can't do entrepreneurship. And it's that. It's that unconscious overgeneralization. It is the assumptions that are made from pieces of evidence about the entire group that people may or may not even be aware of. But I tell you, it happens all the time. There need to be ways to make it safe enough to begin to talk about what the reality is today, or the realities, and the fact that we live in multiple realities, and that pretending it's a meritocracy is just only going to move us backwards. And I'm not quite sure how to do that. I mean, it's going to require everybody's effort and a real willingness to engage and a, and a lot of courage. But it's something that we just have to do. It's the only way out of the box. So that leads me to the question of how do we have that conversation? In other words, um, you you want, it seems to me, in order to to <coughs> have a dialogue, you have to have a, a partner. You have to have someone on the other side of the table who's willing to sit yeah. at the table with yeah. you and engage in these uncomfortable conversations. How do we get the powers that be, whether it's Sand Hill Road or wherever it is, whoever it is, to sit in a, in, in a forum like this or a, a smaller uh, 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 forum? H how do we make yeah. those conversations happen? How do we uh, issue those invitations? So let me first say I'm not the person with the answers here. I'm part of 
Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, I haven't signed up for that, but I want to be <laughs> part of, <laughs> part of it. I, so there was an interesting um, uh, prequel to what happened here yesterday at the Latina, Latino 2 conference for startups hosted by Google that uh, Ana Castro uh, helped organize that uh, uh, we, K4 Center people were part of. And it was the same, the same thing, which was there was a representative from Y Combinator. Y Combinator is the sort of the Harvard of accelerator or incubator programs. And one of the partners was on a panel and said, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're colorblind, that's our, that's our approach. And Frida stood up in the middle of the thing and gave him a good what for. Uh, <laughs> and I had a private conversation, and this is, and because the, the guy who was a junior guy and again, well-intentioned and really didn't know what to do, wanted to have a better outcome and genuinely thought that by being colorblind they were, they were gonna get to one. I said, well, the conversation you could have with your partners is, are we happy with how unrepresentative our graduates are? Unrepresentative in the sense of having roughly, for instance, zero African-American women ever graduating in one of their startup companies out of the 300 that they've done, and their percentages of underrepresented people of color, male, female, is just, you know, it's at the 1% level. I said, look, if you have an internal conversation that starts with, are we happy with this? Is this who we want to be? Is this what we're signed up to be? And you're not, then there's an opening to talk about, well, what is it that is going on that is responsible for this situation? Let us have some understanding and what might we be able to do about it? Because without some interest or concern it's, you know, not, the people aren't going to be engaged. But if there is, it sets the stage for a different kind of conversation. And the thing I could tell you is, now it's not a surprise to you, but I'll just say it, is that white people, privileged white people, they're embarrassed by this. They don't want to appear racist. They don't want to feel they're, they don't want to embarrass other people. They don't know what to do about this. They just want the whole thing to kind of go away, you know, and they want to get back to their happy little lives. And, their, and, and But there has to be a way to help people feel safe enough so that is not the dynamic. And that means, it, it shouldn't, but it sometimes means needing to be more patient with the rich and privileged than by any standard of fairness anybody should be asked to do. But the great leaders that I've seen, and Frida and I have this conversation all the time about who inspires us, whether it's Nelson Mandela or Anita Hill uh, or Ben Jealous, who is the president of the NAACP or others we could name, they have a remarkable capacity to um, not act from a from anger and a grievance-based place, even though their feelings are deep and genuine and they are in no way deluded about the realities of things, there is a broadness and a breadth of outreach and an ability to engage that I think is, is world-changing. And I look to myself to try to develop that capacity. I expect a lot of the other folks too, they're gonna really have to, you know, sign up and, and do some things, but to get things going, I think that's what it may take. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the struggles yeah. that I think certainly as a, a black man you have in 2013 is that um, if there are biases or when there are biases that might lead someone to say yes to this or no to that for reasons conscious or subconscious, it's, it's exceedingly difficult to identify uh, because it's not obvious. It's no, it's no one yelling the N-word at you as you walk down the street. It's just, well, you know, that fellow over there just seemed more qualified or yeah. more that, that, that I just felt like he was more, more capable of, of, uh, yeah. of, of executing. How, how, how do you, um, uh, and I, I, I don't want to 
it, you know, I'll, I'll just preface it by saying I'm not putting all of the, yeah. the uh, <laughs> onus for answering, uh, 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 providing the ultimate uh, uh, answers to these questions on you uh, or giving you responsibility for them. But, you know, and, and actually you don't need to react to it at all if you, if it, but I, I, I just have to get on the table. I think it's one of the most challenging things when people say, well, it doesn't exist and it, it's, there's no, there's no hard thing to point to. And in fact, because capital raising is just hard, it's hard for everybody. Because it's hard, it, 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 it's, even more, uh, it's even more difficult to, to, to put a finger on, which makes it harder to almost have the dialogue or the, or the argument. No, you're right. And this problem isn't going to go away tomorrow. But let me talk about another actual instance, and this is something I'm planning on doing of how to move the needle. And it's not something you should do. It's something the venture capital community needs to do and can do. So we have a company in our portfolio. Um, and we're a, a small investor. And it has a big Silicon Valley firm as a major investor. The company is doing quite well. And the founder is Latino. The founder is Mexican. Um, uh, and they're raising more money. and. He came in and presented to their partnership. Um, and the following, uh, how, to, how to explain this. I was talking to the partner of the other firm who's in charge of that for their partnership. And he was relating what had happened in the partners meeting. And the, the entrepreneur is incredibly well-spoken and has a significant accent. Um, and the question is, well, in sales presentations, of which there are a lot, is the accent such that's, that it's a distraction, or is it actually a business issue or not? And that's a discussion that needs to happen, given I'd ask questions about who you're presenting to, and look, if you're in business, and these are the customers, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But what got related to me was they told the entrepreneur um, well, you should let your co-founder do more of the presenting. It's your style, you know, style. Well, it's a horribly unhelpful thing to say. The right, and when I was talking to the partner and he said this to me, I said, well, do you mean his accent? <laughs> <laughs> And the partner said, well, this was really hard for me. The partner is Chinese, not Chinese-American, Chinese, and also has an accent. Yeah. <laughs> and he basically was telling me he has to swallow all this crap from his partners, although he, I don't <laughs> know him well enough you know, for him to be that direct. But then he told me, he said, yeah, one of my partners, when we're having our private debriefing about this, said, yeah, when I hear the entrepreneur pitch, I feel like, this is a business plan competition. And I thought, how degrading, how horrible is that, that to make that assumption and connection between having an accent and being literally at a, you know, unqualified and not, and just letting it pass. So here's, here's what I have to say. I'm going to be talking about this a bunch, and those partnerships and firms they could have a different internal discussion. They can call each other on this kind of stuff. They can work to find a different way to address the business issues. They can and they should, and this happens 500 times a week in Silicon Valley. And if we can get one or two or three people to start changing, and then that'll help. And what they ought to do is have a, converse, a, a conversation. And it, it may be the case that a little bit of language coaching helps in presentation, uh, but you, to get to that, you've got to have the willingness to be honest and not be embarrassed. And, and life is made up of a million of these kinds of, of details. And you just have to be willing to take it on. You've got you to gotta take, take on all of it. So that's not a solution, but yeah. it's sort of where the, where the edge is at the moment so in Silicon Valley. Um, I want to shift gears for a second and uh, uh, 
ask you a practical question because uh, uh, people in this room or, or entrepreneurs uh, watching this video uh, are certainly hungry to yeah. figure out how to raise capital. Yeah. And one of the, the, um, uh, the things that seems uh, you know, Ted Schlein yesterday said that there was more money available than there had ever been, and I think on some level that's absolutely true. But how does an outsider, both pot perhaps an outsider to Silicon Valley and pot potentially the, the, the tech ecosystem that, that doesn't understand the code, what do they need to do? How do, what's, what's the, how do you raise money in the current environment? That's a big question. <laughs> We've, I, we've got I a few more minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in other words, I, I'm not going to... And, and by the way, let me oh. just clarify. I'm, right. I'm referring to early stage. Right. This right. is all seed early yeah. before you've got something that, that's right. hugely yeah. successful. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do justice to this, but maybe I can put down you know, a, a, a couple of markers. So the, the, first, the first thing is you, you said the code. I, it's necessary to crack the code, to understand that there is a, a culture a worldview, a set of assumptions, ways of doing things, this is in the early stage Silicon Valley, that is how that world operates. And whether it's fair or not, in this context doesn't matter, this is what you have to do to succeed. This is in the same way when we talk to our students in, in, in Smash Academy, we you know, tell them they actually have to be twice as good because they're going to be much more under the spotlight, and this is the rules of the world that, that they're going into. So, and let me also say that the world of raising money in venture capital is not monolithic, and that the way things are done in 2013 in early, very early stage in Silicon Valley is quite different than how everything was 10 or 20 years ago, and still different than the East Coast, and you'll find you can actually get conflicting advice, depending on which VC you talk to. Let me give you a practical. Some people may say, you need to have a nailed down business plan, and you need to have your five-year financials, and you have to be able to back up, have all of your assumptions, and calculate your return on investment. And there, there is a world in which that is relevant, and it is not the world in which I live, and is not the world in which any of us make funding decisions. Nobody comes in with a written business plan. People have 12 slides in a PowerPoint deck, a good story, and a working prototype. And that's incredibly important. When people come in and their presentation says, I've got this patent and the other patent and the other patent, I go, no, that's actually a negative. Show me the prototype. Build something. Make something that works, even if you've got and Brian Dixon, who's an associate at the firm. He's laughing now, hey, Brian, because he, he, does the, he says the same thing to people all the time. Um, it has become sufficiently inexpensive to do, and we're talking about software, internet, consumer, apps, things like that. Um, you actually build something first, and you demonstrate uh, the value of that by showing that at least one or two real people are using it and are deriving value from it. So, I, I mean, I could go on and on about the rules of the game, but the first thing is you got to know the rules of the game. And so here's the thing. Is it, are these secrets or not secrets? Well, it's somewhere in between, because if you know which books to read and take seriously, like the lean startup, uh, and you know which free things to go to, like startup weekends, you can actually rapidly, and you know, without having to know anyone, you don't need to know anyone to buy the book or to register for a startup weekend, you get your first little toehold, and then you start meeting people, and you start you know, acculturating to it, and I would say, you know, it's a semi-permeable membrane. But don't, and the, the value of accelerator programs, especially ones oriented towards women and people of color or to other outsider groups, is they can, in a much more concentrated fashion, help people make that transition if they're coming in from, from, from the outside. That's, that's why they're, you know, they're, they're, they're good things. So there's, there's, there's just a whole bunch of things that, that people actually can do. So, um, this is yeah. a good segue to, yeah. uh, you've reorganized your yeah. organization. You, you've now created something called the KPOR Center for Social yeah. Impact, and you've merged your social uh, 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 operations with 
your investing operations. Tell us a little bit about that, why you did it, and what the new structure is, what it means, how it works, what the intent is. It, it was an um, organic evolution on top of the work that we had been doing for the past um, many years. And so there's a part of the story which is the personal part, and then there's the part of it which is the strategic outward-facing uh, part. And I'll just give you a little sample of both. So the, the personal first, to ground it. So Frida and I have known each other for almost 30 years now. And when I was starting Lotus, uh, not half a mile from here, a few blocks away, um, and we were the very high growth software company of the 1980s from zero to 50 million in sales in the first year and then 150 million the next year. That was 83 and 84. Frida came on board uh, right after she'd gotten her PhD in social policy and research with a unique job description, which was to build the most progressive corporate culture of any company in the US. And Lotus was at, way out there in, in the 80s. There were uh, benefits for same-sex couples 30 years ago, and a lot of other things that we were just, we, we were serious about this. Mainly, not mainly, but my personal motivation, I was a, a social misfit and outsider, about six standard deviations off the mean when I was growing up. <laughs> long before there was anything cool about being a nerd. <laughs> and it hurt. And it was traumatic. And it was painful. And when I found myself in this position of having this high growth software company and, oh, by the way, no adult supervision, which was just great, I said, let's build the kind of company that even someone like me would want to would wanna work for. So that we had a professional partnership first. And then a dozen years later, we got together as a couple. And, and, and Frida had started her own consulting business doing surveys and training and working with elite white male institutions where men had zipper problems. She was the, the go-to person in the universe on, on that. Um, many very high profile clients on, 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 on Wall Street and in academia and the UN and the World Bank. And you want to name any names? I don't know. Well, I yeah. About yeah. That. <laughs> no, I, I mean, mean <laughs> it's, it is not a secret <laughs> that elite white male institutions, they have periodic outbreaks of zipper <laughs> problems <laughs> that they wind up on the front page of the New York Post or, you know, everywhere. And, and in the aftermath of that, actually, that is one of the things that gets people to take this stuff seriously. This is on, particularly on gender and sexual harassment issues, is extreme public humiliation of a prolonged fashion. So I don't recommend that, but that is an entry point <laughs> for, for institutions, and, and Frida has a lot of experience. Okay, so there's, we have been finding ways as our worlds have come together to do more of our work together, and I really give Frida the credit for seeing this and being the, the architect of it. And at this stage in our lives, and I'm, I'm 62 now, while I still get excited about helping entrepreneurs, it motivates me, I'm interested in doing it in the context of those entrepreneurs who are making a difference in the world, who are closing gaps and trying to make the world a better place. I just can't get excited about just another business. I don't want to put my time into it. And so the investing practice was changing to have more social impact anyway. And we were figuring the education programs like SMASH were maturing through the first phase of their life cycle. And we began to ask ourselves what else to do. We have a great crop of new leaders who are decades younger than us who will carry the torch forward and provide the leadership. And it's all, the, the sinew that ties it all together is well, what is it the, in, the intersection of information technology and social impact? Because those are the worlds that we live in. Frida was out in high school cutting class to go picket for Cesar Chavez and the farm workers. So she's been doing this for a very long time. I come at this from just 
being the total outsider. And the, 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 the Kapor Center for Social Impact is an attempt to bring our concerns together in ways that can have an ongoing and, and lasting impact that ultimately depend less and less on us personally, because as we've observed, we are not going to be around forever. Indeed. Um, so, so yeah. yeah. this is the last question. I'm going to uh, uh, take uh, some audience questions. Um, we've been here three days. Yeah. Um, are there any uh, sort of things that you would highlight as yeah. a, uh, uh, that, that for you have come out of the conference that you think would be uh, valuable to amplify? Yeah, well, as I've said, I, I'm coming away with a personal commitment. I'm serious about finding a way of engaging Ted Schlein and Kleiner Perkins and venture capital in this sort of dialogue, and I'd like your support and help on that. Um, the second thing I think that can come out of this is, is the following. It has always been possible for members of outsider groups in very small numbers to succeed in the mainstream as exceptions. And there's no doubt that if nothing else happens, some people here will continue to succeed at even higher levels. But I think there's a lost opportunity because if success is done, is seen as, well, that person's an exception, it doesn't do anything to bring the whole group along, to raise everyone up. But there's clearly an opportunity by working together, by having solidarity, by collaborating, by supporting each other, there are opportunities to bring up the whole group and to make it easier for the next set of people to come along. And I'll underscore this in absolutely no way gets anybody else off the hook who isn't here, zero. So it is not an either or, it's a both and. But my hope would be that this event mark, genuinely marks the beginning of an ongoing community of support and outreach to bring more people of color into the innovation economy. It would be a terrible lost opportunity not to. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, are there any questions, comments, anyone? in the audience. I see, I see, I see a couple. Oh, Mitch, first off, I just want to thank you for being here. Obviously, there's lots of ways that we could spend our time on a Sunday, but I applaud you being here. I applaud you speaking out and having a voice that is so strong in the industry to share your thoughts with someone like Ted and the rest of us, so thank you. Um, my question is more about understanding audiences, and when you look at startups, venture firms, technology firms, the audience that they're trying to get, the consumers, increasingly in this country are multicultural consumers, a third of the country, and by you know, some estimates, by 2042, over 50% of the country will be multicultural. To what extent do these either startups, venture firms, how are they thinking about the makeup of the audiences that they're trying to get? Because obviously all of these companies are trying to get users, but these users are increasingly multicultural. How does that factor into the dialogue at all? Well, currently it's an enormous source of competitive advantage for Kapor Capital because that is how, how we operate. Um, in that if you're going for a broad consumer market with, with an app or a service, you need to understand the demographics of the country have changed already. I mean, in California is the future where, where, you know, where, where we live. So it's not going to happen. It has happened already in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and one of the things that points that I make is often entrepreneurs in developing their idea, they're scratching their own itch. So if people have a different lived experience, they're going to see different problems and hence different opportunities. And in a country where the demographics are changing, 
entrepreneurs who come from groups outside the mainstream, African Americans, Latinos, and others actually have it's an, an advantage in that they're going to be more tuned into the next wave of big opportunities and therefore as investors being connected to them and creating a portfolio which is welcoming to them is a source of competitive advantage for investors. So I and you know all, all of us at the KPOR Center, these are points that we make regularly, what I would say is people are now listening in the investment community. I have some social capital there, and also we have a good portfolio. So it is getting paid more attention. A lot of investors are sheep. They are followers, not all. So, and, and, and so what will actually happen is there'll be a tipping point, and all of a sudden, everybody will get it. It's kind of like social networks, well, like what's a social network? And then all of a sudden, you know, because of Facebook within a year, it's all about the social network. So I don't think we're gonna see incremental progress here, but I do think it's just a question of can we speed up the process by which the investing community, this is around consumer, understands the ingredients for success, because that will be helpful in, you know, in a number of ways. And obviously when you can make purely business-based arguments that don't get into that uncomfortable zone. You obviously have a much easier time having the conversations with people. It's not gonna be sufficient to do that, but in a sense, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. Now, the, the, the fruit isn't ripe yet, but I think if we, to, to really break this darn metaphor, if we tend and cultivate that <laughs> garden, we'll have a good crop of fruit and <laughs> low-hanging and, okay. Uh. Uh, good morning. I'm Arbor Rice, and I'm president of the New York Urban League, and I wanted to thank you so much for your comments this morning. Your, t your take, your understanding um, of race is very um, advanced. It's evolved. It's nuanced. Um, and even the, the, the conversation that your wife um, presented yesterday and her the work that you've done with the center and also your stopping in the middle of your comments to include your staff and to call on a, a graduate of your program was a, a walking and talking example. You all don't just speak it, but you live it. And, it, and, and I, so I wanna thank you for that and I appreciate that. But my question is, and you alluded to it a little bit about being an outsider, but I wanted to know what is the moment or moments that, that help to enable the racial consciousness that you have and how we can as individuals to help to spur that in the individuals that we work with. The Urban League has always been a, um, a racial, um, we bring together black and white folks in order to do the work that we do, but sometimes I have been surprised at the defensiveness that I sometimes have of people that even sit on my board of directors. And so, so, so the fact that you've been able to um, have that level of, of racial discourse is amazing and I just wanna know how we can replicate that. I don't think I can give you a full answer to that question, but mm -hmm. I, I hope I can say a couple of meaningful things. So the first thing is, again, Frida, would you stand up for a minute, please? <laughs> I know, that's why I want you to stand up. Yeah. Um, it, I, I was so happy she went first, got the speaking slot, and got to tell the full story. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be up here on stage, and Hank, thank you for inviting me, but I think I can say it was done kind of in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and, but all too often, because I'm the person, the entrepreneur with a reputation, I wind up getting credit that Frida deserves. And it's, it's painful to her, it's painful to me, um, but that is also part of how the world works. It's another kind of stereotype sort of, sort of thing, and it's around gender. And So here, this is an audience where I can say the inspiration and in my teacher and guide around how I got to where I got, it's, it's her, and without her, none of this would have happened. So I just, I just thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. Okay, that's point one. The moment, there, there was a moment there actually was a moment um, when I was 15, I went to a summer program 
We were trying to catch up with Sputnik. NSF was funding gifted and talented programs. I went to one, all boys, called the Summer Science Program. All white boys. <laughs> and it was a life-changing experience for me. It was six weeks, intensive immersion, rigorous academics. I was with a set of peers for the first time where I was respected for who I was. Um, and I had my first hands-on computer experiences. It was a life-changing experience for me. When Frida and her co-founder started our education programs, and I won't give you the whole backstory on this because just because of time, but I met one of the kids who uh, was a undergrad at UC Berkeley because we had a scholarship program. He was African-American, Filipino. He was an orphan. And he's an amazing kid. Met him at a high school. I should say now, he just graduated from medical school with an MBA. We've known him 10 years. And he's like in psychiatry, and he's doing a psychiatry residency. But at the time, he was like a college freshman or sophomore. And we had Thanksgiving together because he didn't have any family and he didn't have anywhere to go. So we invited him and I had a long conversation with him. And I understood that on the, while on the outside, his origins and background and class, race, to say nothing of age, the differences between us were very large. On the inside, not so much. There was the aspiration to become what he could become and he was a very smart and somewhat shy person, and all he wanted was an opportunity. And if you gave him an opportunity, he was going to do what he could do. And I said, that was me. That was me when I was 15. And I had my very hard times, including, by the way, at MIT, I will say, where when I was going around saying personal computers are great and the next this is in the late 1970s, the next big thing, people laughed at me. They scorned me here because that little tiny PC was a joke compared to, so this kid's name was PK. Anyway, there was that moment, that empathy, that connection. And so to your question, I now think about how can you create those moments of empathy so that people start seeing themselves as connected, common humanity, shared experience, we're all in this together, you're not so different than I am, or you are different, but there are these core pieces that we all have in common. How do you create and engender them so people are operating out of a different paradigm? I don't have the answers to that, but I, 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 I I have the firm belief that that's a very good question to keep asking and come up with creative solutions. We're not gonna win by arguing. We're not gonna win by setting policy alone, although we have to set policy. Uh, we're not gonna win, as in my hometown of Oakland, by rioting in the streets. And tra we, Oakland had, after Trayvon Martin, it seems to be the one place where there was civil disorder. I mean, I understand the anger and frustration, but that is not going to be the way we're going to get somewhere. Mitch, thank you very, yeah. very much. This is a great conversation. Thank, really thank you for having me. Here. Thank you for having me. That's great. Thank you, sir. Thank you.